So, good morning, everybody. Um, again, a welcome, a very warm welcome to week three, uh, panel three of Kalpana. Uh, I'm Darshana Joshi. Uh, this introduction is for our friends who are joining us through YouTube or other uh, means of communication like on Facebook Live and uh, uh, through our Twitter feed. So we are very, very excited to have uh, Professor GN and uh, Richa Srivastava with us today. Uh, my colleague Bharti will explain more about Program Kalpana and give introductions to our speakers for today. I'm just going to give an introduction about uh, Vigyan Shala. So as you all know, Vigyan Shala is a young not-for-profit which is uh, passionate about bridging the access, attainability, and quality gap in STEM education. And we are doing this by bridging uh, mentors from all across the globe to students in India. And Kalpana is our uh, effort in that direction. So Bharti, over to you. And uh, thank you for joining us. Bharti, you are muted. Bharti, we can't hear you. Yeah. OK, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. OK, OK. So, um, so we can good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Bharti Singhal, and I'm lead of program Kalpana. Vigyan Shala's Kalpana, it aims to reimagine STEM fields with enhanced participation of women by equipping girls with tools to explore broader possibilities in STEM. Uh, we envision to create a self-sustaining and uplifting community of women in STEM who can support each other. This is an immersive seven-week mentoring and professional development program that has been designed by women STEM professionals from leading global universities. This program has three major components. The first aspect is focusing on the fresh take of Kalpana on mentoring, where we have funneled the experiences, real life experiences of professional uh, women in STEM so that we can equip girls with the requisite tools of interpersonal and professional development. The second aspect, it is to bring STEM leaders, innovators, entrepreneurs, and scientists in interactive discussions to encourage girls to reimagine wider possibilities in STEM careers. And the third aspect is to bring powerful personal stories from STEM leaders and providing the Kalpana Network support for continuous growth, uh, motivation, and encouragement. So before going any further, I would also like to thank our collaborators, Udyan Shalini Fellowship Program of Udyan Care. It is a Delhi-based NGO, and its Shalini Fellowship uh, is basically empowering young girls with quality higher education. And today in this program, we have 60 girls from Udyan Shalini Program with us. In today's session, we are excited to host Professor G. Nagarjuna from Homi Baba Center for Science Education, Mumbai, and Richa Srivastava, Managing Director of, Managing Partner of Makers Asylum, to dig deeper and understand the importance of inculcating STEM habits and tinkering for social good. So to begin with, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the day, <coughs> Professor Nagarjuna Gadiraju, fondly known as GN, Professor Nagarjuna is a professor at Homi Baba Center for Science Education, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. His major interest, uh, research interests include science education, cognitive science, history, and philosophy of science and structure, and dynamics of knowledge. As an activist, he focuses on promoting free knowledge and free software, and serves as the chairperson of Free Software Foundation of India. GN did MSc in Biology and MA in Philosophy from Mumbai and a PhD of Science from IIT Kanpur. Some of his areas of interest are semantic web, knowledge organization, AI, philosophy of science, biological roots of knowledge and modeling complex systems with specific interest in cognitive development. He is the author of Specification and Implementation of Distributed Knowledge, base called GNOWSYS. He is an architect of gknowledge.org, a community portal which was launched on 2nd February 2007. 
He contributed as a core developer and architect of Self Platform. We we are actually really excited to have Professor Gian here, educating us about STEM habits and sharing his initiatives. One of the coolest chat shalas from Cool STEM Games. I encourage you all to join the platform after this session today. So over to you, sir. Thank you for coming today and joining us. <clears throat> okay, so thanks. Uh, I thought uh, <clears throat> we're going to have a conversation. So you basically asking me to speak. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a very long introduction, which is uh, almost you read my bio data. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I I really don't know where to start. Maybe uh, uh, you know because uh, you've been talking about uh, Kalpana is a nice name <clears throat> for uh, uh, and the subtitle of your program is actually about. <clears throat> reimagining uh, STEM education. So essentially, we're talking about uh, punar kalpana rather than just mere mere kalpana. And <clears throat> and uh, so, how do we uh, do that? I mean, we sometimes have to learn lessons from uh, what we know best. Uh, before we go on, maybe uh, we just need to uh, know a little bit about where we are. In STEM in India, I think uh, uh, not only for uh, women in STEM in India as well as uh, actually uh, anyone uh, in India, where are we? Kind of thing. So uh, may I just ask uh, uh, one question in terms of the format of this program? Or uh, you want me to speak for uh, maybe some time and then take question answers? Uh, uh, what is the idea? So uh, we can take questions at the end of both the uh, talks, and but you can make your talk interactive if you want. You can take questions in between if you want, and we can pick uh, answers or we can choose girls to answer that particular question as well. Sir, we can't hear you. Sir, you are. Sir, we can't hear you. Yeah. I miss. Sir, we can't hear you. Uh, Sir. Yeah, <clears throat> I, yeah, I think uh, now, the mic got accidentally. Uh, so I was about to upload, and the mute button was just next to it. <laughs> so that got. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm actually uh, just sharing my screen. Um, uh, I uh, can you see uh, anything? Uh, Yes, sir, we can see the slides. What do you see? Uh, why games? Uh, why games? Yeah, why games? Yeah, yeah. OK, so um, actually, I uh, uh, am not able to see uh, my own screen here. Uh, one second, just give me a sec. All right, <clears throat> so uh, the uh, so why am I asking this question uh, about uh, why games? Uh, is because uh, from the uh, from the history of uh, India, for example, you know whether it is uh, women cricket or it is men cricket, uh, we are number one in the world. I hope all of you agree. Uh, we are always, you know, uh, I mean, may not may not be the case that we may be picking up the world. Uh, uh, World Cup or uh, uh, all the time, but we are always the main uh, game changers uh, of this format. Now, the question that we have to ask is that uh, why did this happen for India? And if you ask, uh, the, re the very reason why I'm asking this question is because in, in STEM, uh, whether it is technology, engineering, mathematics or science, uh, we are nowhere in the last, in, even in the first hundred uh, in the entire world. So that is the current situation. Uh, some of you may not agree with me, but uh, that is the sad uh, picture uh, when it comes to the achievements of Indians in the area of uh, STEM. So, uh, so I wanted to uh, uh, just give an idea about uh, the reason for that. 
Okay, so in any kind of a game, uh, what we do, uh, we play them together. And now we have to ask the same question about uh, do we play STEM together? Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, we actually try to compete with each other rather than collaborate with each other when it comes to the STEM areas, both in education uh, as well as uh, otherwise. We always want to uh, compete with our peers. I'm not saying that there is no competition in STEM. There are, but it's a uh, one team competing with another team. Uh, it's not one person competing with another person. So that's a major uh, difference in the way how. So it's it just like, uh, uh, you know, in a team game like uh, cricket or football, that, that's exactly what we do. So we work together to achieve something. Uh, and uh, the reason why we are calling them as games is also because uh, STEM games are also games where we follow certain rules. So the other important reason why uh, games are very interesting is that uh, starting from our childhood, uh, we get involved. And it's easy to enter a game. But uh, if you look at uh, STEM, it's uh, very, very difficult to enter the, the, the STEM arena, so to speak. So the, the playground of STEM is so difficult that uh, uh, after your 12th, uh, most of the people try for uh, these competitive exams and uh, you know how many of them actually manage to make it. And the rest of the people, uh, more than 99% of the people actually feel as if they are failures. So that is what the current uh, education system uh, as well as the, the professional uh, uh, bodies that perform uh, and make us to be part of that, give this kind of a feeling. And uh, another interesting thing that you see is that these boys, where are they playing the game? Uh, if you actually look at it, uh, uh, the ball doesn't look like a cricket ball. And the bat certainly is not uh, uh, a cricket bat, but it looks like one. Uh, and But still, uh, they're quite involved uh, in the whole process. And even though these are not like, uh, uh, you know, Sachin or Dhoni or Kohli who is playing, but still, you know, you have spectators for them. You know, wherever they play, people always like to watch them. So that's exactly what we have to ask when we are doing, when we are learning science, do we have spectators uh, in our school, college? Uh, so, and, and where are the spectators for uh, STEM practices in India. Uh, suppose uh, somebody gets uh, an award, let us say, uh, uh, not necessarily a Nobel Prize, but uh, at least a Bhatnagar Prize or something like that. So uh, where are the people to applaud them? Uh, and who understands what did they achieve? Uh, so, so this is the uh, contrast that I wanted to draw here. Like uh, we have to ask, where are the spectators for STEM? But for games like cricket, we have plenty of them. And in fact, it's very important for uh, STEM practices to be rooted in the society, that uh, it's not just that we have to play uh, STEM practices, but we also need to find spectators for it, because it is the spectators who support the enterprise. And uh, and as you can see here, that uh, uh, some of you who understand the game, and I suppose that most of you understand this game, uh, one of them is judging uh, by saying that the person is out, and the people, the other players, are actually claiming uh, the fact that uh, you are a gone case. So the, the reason that happens is because the people who are playing the game understand the rules of the game. So this is a... Uh, sort of rather uh, poor situation in the country, for example, uh, where even though we sit in the same department, uh, if uh, one of you write a publication, the other scientist who is sitting just next to your cabin doesn't even read or judge uh, what you're doing. Even 
they don't like to even say that uh, what you did is uh, wrong or incorrect. So we are not a society where we give feedback to each other. And, uh, and this is actually one of the uh, major problems why uh, we don't work together. Uh, you know, even when scientists compete with each other, you can actually very see that that competition is so healthy because each one is finding mistakes in the other person's experiments or pursuits or what they write. And this is very important for the success of uh, the STEM game, uh, wherever you play it. Okay, so, uh, and as you can see here, uh, that uh, when uh, we like to play the STEM game, the first thing that we ask is, uh, uh, do we have a lab? Uh, where is the lab? I mean, our lab is not sophisticated. Uh, how can I work uh, in my uh, in my school? I, I don't have a microscope. I don't have a telescope. I don't have uh, chemicals. I don't have uh, an incubator. Uh, I don't have a PCR machine. So how do I do it? So this is the normal uh, question that a lot of uh, uh, lecturers uh, who work in colleges keep asking because uh, we keep asking them to do STEM research. But then the teachers keep saying that uh, uh, we, we don't have a lab. How do we do it? Now look at these children. Uh, they want to play the game called cricket. I mean, anything that looks like a ground becomes a ground for them. And anything that looks like a wicket, or even if it doesn't look like a wicket, as in this particular case, is being reimagined, so to speak, uh, as, a, as, a, as a wicket. And they don't have shoes, as you can see. Uh, they don't have a uniform. They don't care. But they just want to get involved in the process. And here is another example. Uh, well, uh, this place, as you can see, the, the reimagination and creativity requires this kind of uh, solutions. So wh what happens if you don't have a PCR machine? So can I uh, make it uh, frugally? I don't have a microscope. Can I uh, get a microscope uh, or can I make one? Uh, is there a way of uh, using existing uh, resources that I have and actually convert it into a microscope? And uh, where do I do it? And how do I do it? So, so here you can see that uh, uh, very, very uh, clear imagination comes up. You may think that you know this is not real creativity, but actually you will see that uh, that happens. And and everybody. Uh, uh, plays cricket and uh, cricket is enjoyed by women as well as men, children, adults, everyone. And the reason for that is that it is played in every street. Now, let me emphasize this. This is very important. The reason why uh, India doesn't produce STEM producers, we are all STEM consumers, is a country of largest consumers of STEM both content uh, as well as otherwise. And the question, therefore, that we have to ask is, what is the reason? So if you ask me, my diagnosis is because, because we don't play STEM in the streets. Unless we play STEM in the streets, we are not going to produce a culture that is academically quite active. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the history uh, of the academies that we are running. Uh, it started at a place where uh, in the Roman uh, arenas, you know, where people used to play all kinds of games, there was this hero called Socrates, uh, who actually started philosophical games of having conversations and on the street. He used to go and catch anyone on the street and uh, start having an argument with them. And that is how philosophy is born. So. These academies, uh, of course, um, uh, Socrates, uh, one of the Socrates uh, Chela, uh, who was uh, always with him during his uh, street walks, was uh, the greatest philosopher called Plato. And he started the Plato's Academy. Uh, and so that is how the academies actually started. When, But the important thing that we need to understand is that the academies took birth uh, on the street. And that is the lesson why uh, I wanted to say this point. If you can't take STEM to the streets, uh, I don't think we will be able to uh, think about uh, how to restructure this whole thing. 
Well, this uh, innovation and imitation both continue, as you can see brilliantly. Just uh, uh, a paper carton becomes uh, the protecting devices for these people. Of course, they are not actually playing with a cricket ball. Therefore, they actually don't need a protection. But still, they want to imitate. Uh, imitate what they see on the TV. Uh, and uh, this doesn't stop, this imagination, as you can see. Anything that looks like a wicket, uh, a broomsticks become. And, and so we have to learn a lot from these people. And this is no less tinkering. And the reason why I'm also mentioning is because these are the children who already tinker in their regular life. And when they join school and college, they stop doing that. I think we have to really reflect on this issue. What is it so wrong in our schools and colleges that we stop these tinkering children, which are tinkering by birth, as the way, you know, life is full of tinkering uh, and imagination and uh, imitation and uh, innovation. So why are we dropping all these things and getting into academies where uh, they don't allow us to do anything other than consuming knowledge and the lessons that uh, we learn from the teachers? And uh, how can anybody be called a teacher if they can't help us to produce knowledge? We don't want to consume knowledge. I think this is the first important call that all of you uh, as young uh, STEM practitioners have to realize is that we have to take a pledge saying that, no, we don't want to be consumers. We want to shape the new uh, game of STEM ourselves, uh, the way how uh, cricket is done in this country. So uh, this is uh, my uh, important uh, point that I want you to ponder about. So just as we took cricket to the streets and became world class, and I'm actually saying this reason because in any country where cricket is not in the streets has never become world class. There is a reason for that. And that reason is that you can't actually maintain a very good team unless uh, we have a lot of spectators and a lot of players across the country. And that kind of base of the pyramid is not very strong. I would like to take here a small example uh, to tell why I like this example so much. Let us imagine uh, that uh, our uh, top cricketers, uh, let us say uh, 15, 16 of them and whatever that team is, suppose they have been uh, captured uh, in some island. And uh, uh, so uh, let us say they all gone to some place and then they're not uh, now approachable. And uh, so the situation that I'm imagining is that we lost the top 15 people in India of the cricket. Now the question that you have to ask is, how long will India take to produce the next team, the cricket team? So if anybody want to, want to ask the answer this question, I'd be very happy. How long would Indian country will take to produce the next best cricket team in the country? Uh, so maybe one Anusha. month. Maybe one month. It will take a very, yeah, maybe one month. Yeah, okay. And the, now the question that I'm asking is that uh, take away the IITs, TIFRs, and ICERs. Let us say the top scientists from India have been taken uh, to something like a remote island. Uh, they've been sent out. Uh, they've been hijacked or grouped by somebody who doesn't like uh, the country. So how long will India take to, to, to regenerate the scientific expertise in the country? The top leaders are no longer available. So how much time do we take Prob to rejuvenate? Probably a decade or so. So what so does this tell us? Years to 10 years. So five what does years. this tell us? OK, yeah. So yeah, five, five years, years, it could be 10 years. Well, your imagination is as good as mine in this case. The reason sure, why we have to reflect. Unpredictable, sir. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But now why is it that uh, in the case of cricket, uh, we will be able to find out uh, uh, best people? Because of one important reason, that we have plenty of them. 
and how 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 is that plentiful possible in the case of cricket because it is played in every street corner and it is played there are clubs all over the country now tell me one thing where are the clubs in india for stem and you will hear the story from richa a while uh, uh, maybe uh, after me uh, richa will tell us how difficult it was for them to create a club called the makers asylum where they wanted to create a, a, a small space and invite uh, members from the community to do something to make something so the question is that uh, uh, nowadays when we build uh, a residential apartment uh, set uh, some kind of uh, home communities uh, we think of a swimming pool we think of uh, maybe a badminton court as well as a cricket ground and things like that within the space but are we also thinking about at least one maker space in that uh, residential uh, space how many colonies do we have across the country i mean i live in a scientific colony called brc we don't have uh, a tinkering space within such a uh, thousands and thousands of scientists are living in my colony and we don't have a maker space and the children don't have a tinkering space at all and the people who want to become scientists are expected to read books you can't read science you have to do it and you can't even become a poet by reading you have to write poems you you can't become a writer unless you start writing so this is the important thing that we have to do and that is one of the major problems with our education system and that is why we have to do this punar kalpana and and that is the important thing so i am using this cricket to uh, not only as inspiration because it inspired me quite a lot but it is also the reason uh, why we have a lot of things to learn from there because except cricket maybe we don't have anything to talk about in india where we are number 1 so so that is uh, uh, the situation of uh, exactly where we are and then where we want to go so if we want to reimagine uh, the stem space within the country we have to ask for maker spaces tinkering spaces laboratories everywhere across the country at home as well as on the street or in the residential colonies or uh, in the uh, addas out there uh, when, uh, when we go out for chai uh, let us say in tf to the canteen uh, what do we do uh, we keep discussing for hours uh, on, on various topics under the sun and now my question is is that chat shala that adda uh, Actual, and that is the question that we have to ask. And in fact, uh, uh, that is uh, these are some of the reasons why uh, we actually thought of uh, reimagining uh, STEM education and reimagining the uh, future Indian classrooms and colleges. Uh, and should we we do we need classrooms or patshalas or do we need uh, chat shalas? And I am certainly one of those. Uh, who would opt for a chat shala and a maker space but uh, just a maker space is not enough because uh, we have to have the chat shala as well associated to it so while we play this games uh, i mean all of you know uh, how much we gossip about cricket and everywhere we gossip of course uh, i don't want to leave out uh, the people who actually gossip about football in particularly in goa and northeast uh as well you know because in india everywhere we don't uh, play cricket uh, examples are goa and northeast uh, they play football and for them football is uh, their way of life so this is uh, uh, a point that we need to uh, reflect about and uh, uh, so uh, i actually want to stop here because uh, and uh, uh, just want you to think about this analogy that i drew at this moment this moment in cricket and stem games 
So are we ready to make uh, STEM games in this country, just as the way we want to do cricket? Are we ready to do uh, frugal STEM labs? Like, uh, are we ready to make a broomstick uh, as uh, a wicket in the STEM games? So I'll, I'll stop here and maybe uh, take questions uh, uh, along the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful talk. And I think we need more of tinkering right now. And I think the girls are really understanding that the maker space is what they need to excel in their STEM careers forward. I think we will take questions further, but there is one statement that another mentor who took the internal discussion today, he said, we need more archerikers uh, if we need Sachin Tendulkar's in STEM. So obviously, if uh, anybody who wants to excel we need more people who can make such great people as well. So likewise in STEM, taking to that, I think now we can go ahead and have our, have our second talk before we go on to the question and answer session. So for that, I would like to introduce uh, Richa Srivastava. So, okay. Richard, uh, do we have you with us? Here. Okay, so. Uh, okay, I'm going to. So, uh, Richard Srivastava is the managing partner at Makers Asylum. Richard drives strategic collaborations and partnerships for Makers Asylum. She believes that the future of learning is evolving and alternative spaces will be significant in customizing people's, people's learning journeys. This is space focused on fostering innovation through purpose-based learning on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This space houses various that are created in order to facilitate prototyping of ideas that are interdisciplinary in nature. Richa is also a graduate from Indian School of Business and Bachelor of Engineering, Electronics and Communication from Birla Institute of Technology. In her previous stint, she worked with government of Andhra Pradesh to drive IT investment into the state. She has also been particularly instrumental in forging strategic partnerships with the likes of Monetary Authority of Singapore, Visa, Thomson Reuters, and 30 plus such partners for FinTech Valley, Visa. During the ongoing pandemic, Richa has been recognized as a Vogue Warriors from India, as the woman who has helped design half a million face shields to help frontline and essential workers. We are really excited to have you, Richa, today with us and to share her, sharing her views on tinkering for social good. Over to you, Richa. Thank you so much. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I've been a little, um, I had a little emergency this morning, so I had to fly down to Bangalore, hence I was not reachable. So all the people who were trying to call me, really sorry. And uh, hopefully my connection is uh, stable and uh, all of you can hear me. Uh, very nice to meet everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Richa and I, can I share my screen by the way? Okay, one second. You have about 15 minutes to speak. Um, okay, perfect. All right, so I'm just gonna show a quick presentation. Um, can you see my uh, presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. So that's me, Rucha. I am uh, I and my husband, Webha, we run a space called Maker's Asylum. Uh, it's a maker space. Uh, like in the previous conversation, we were talking about maker spaces. So we are one of the maker spaces in Mumbai, uh, but we recently shifted to Goa in the pandemic. And uh, just a little quick background about myself. Um, I uh, 
I grew up in a lot of cities growing up. So all my life I've been like traveling because of my uh, dad's work. So I grew up in about 10 cities. Uh, I always was interested in science and, um, you know, uh, and I love tinkering and making stuff. So I decided, you know, that I wanted to be an engineer. So eventually in life, I uh, did my engineering from uh, Birla Institute of Technology in Mestra and Ranchi, uh, where I did my electronics and communication engineering. Uh, then I went on to sort of work for the telecommunication sector uh, with Idea Cellular, which is part of the Aditya Birla group, where I was working in technology strategy. So my role was primarily to, in the beginning, my role was actually quite, uh, quite technical in the sense that I was working on uh, there are these network switches that are there in telecom. So I was kind of like the operation maintenance person for it. So had a lot of night shifts. I used to do a lot of coding, maintaining, hardware maintenance, software maintenance, and a lot of things like that. And uh, post that, I was the chief technology officer uh, at IDEA, where my role was primarily to work on technology strategy with the leadership of the organization. Post that, I decided to do my MBA. So I went to Indian School of Business for that, which is in Hyderabad. Uh, and then it was very uh, interesting uh, uh, thing because I never wanted to sort of work for the government. Like all of us sort of think about governments and, you know, have our apprehensions about it. But uh, I incidentally got a job with the government of Andhra Pradesh where I was uh, working for the Chief Minister's IT Advisory and Strategy where we were working on uh, creating a startup ecosystem in uh, Vizag, especially around fintech. Uh, that's when, um, towards a later part of that, uh, my husband and I, Weber, we were dating at the time, and uh, Weber was looking for somebody. He started making his asylum back in 2003. Chabi, okay, I think she's. Yeah, uh, he was looking for someone to sort of bring in more uh, financial sustainable perspective to a maker space. And we both, uh, I was in an open space where I wanted to explore something more exciting. That's when we started working together. And now um, I particularly look about, uh, look at how can maker spaces like ours be financially sustainable? How can there be business cases around a space like this? Because obviously having a space like this is very important in our uh, perspective. But at the same time, the financial viability of a place like this is uh, uh, is something that everyone's still um, you know discussing. So my area and my role uh, particularly uh, corresponds to this particular part of Makers Asylum. I am a maker in a way, but like my my more focus is around uh, how do we keep things sustainable? How do we create more spaces like this? How do we make things um, viable for people to sustain longer? Uh, so that's where we are. And yeah, that's a little bit of background about myself. And I just wanted to take you through a quick um, uh, insight into uh, what it looks like. So this is our space in Mumbai. Um, this was our space in Mumbai. Uh, uh, this is, was about 10,000 square feet. So you can see a lot of people. We always have a lot of people hanging around, doing things, making things. So we have a metal shop. Uh, the, uh, this is Priyank, one of our members, who's making this beautiful metal table. Uh, he's a metal artist. Then we have a wood shop where we do a lot of carpentry um, and woodworking. We also have a laser cutting lab where um, this is a beautiful machine. It does a lot of things. It's engraves, it cuts. There's a lot of really interesting things that can be done with the machine. A lot of architects, a lot of designers come to the space to use the machine. Uh, and prototype their products. Uh, we have an electronics lab and we have a large community space where we host people uh, because it's open for everyone to come. So what I mean to say open to everyone is it's like a community lab in like, you know, in the previous conversation we were talking about to have, you know, conversations about uh, STEM, about uh, electronics, about like whatever that we want, a little like a geek spot for people to come and hang out and, uh, learn at the same time, create, collaborate, and do uh, amazing things. Uh, so that's a little bit about the space. And of course, we have a lovely barbecue grill that we've made at Makers Asylum that we use to host all these conversations and, uh, you know, uh, and all the makers of the community. Uh, so um, there are a lot of these installations um, that we work around, uh, and a lot of people come to 
the space to do these uh, machines to make installations. That's Kushbu, one of our members. She's an architect. She's making this installation for uh, Make in India, which is made out of uh, the laser cutting machine, a few materials that she's been using. Uh, we have some projects like the electric wheel share where uh, the community we work with the differently abled community to work for their problems with them uh, so you know projects like these are also something which is there in the open space uh, we have a satellite ground station that is um, that is being made so it's an open source satellite ground station that's been made by the community at the space quite exciting um, very uh, interesting project music for example, a lot of that's uh, Rizwan, who's a, a musician who comes and makes music and instruments over there. Uh, uh, making shop, there's something called the Plastic Recycling Lab that we did. We did uh, this project in the Lieber where we um, have converted a mobile van into so where you can actually go and put wash your um, uh, bottle over here. We have plastic extruding and shredding it inside it, and there's a 3D printer at the back. So it sort of depicts the circular economy of things, and it goes to a lot of schools and, ch and children to teach them plastic recycling and what can be done. Um, and then, of course, we love a lot of sparks, a lot of metalworking, and uh, things like that. So that's pretty much how our space is like. And what we primarily focus on is access to learning and access to tools. Uh, that's a oh, you know, primary focus of Makers Asylum. Um, but we, just like everyone else, um, had to shut down the space when India went into the biggest lock national lockdown on the 23rd of March. And that's when we, at the space, decided to stay back at the asylum to keep making. So um, so me, Bebhav, Naren, who's a part of our team, three of us decided to quarantine at the space. And that's where M19 initiative started, which was... Uh, uh, which was um, basically focused on uh, providing COVID relief. Uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, when, on the 23rd, when things went, um, you know, uh, when the whole country went into lockdown, um, we really thought that it's important for us to stay next to our tools so that we can keep contributing in a meaningful way. And uh, we really did not, not realize that there was, the situation in India was very grave out there. Uh, but what we were doing at the lab was we were uh, prototyping, prototyping, you can see on the left side about this, on uh, the 25th of March on our social media. And suddenly we were getting a lot of requests from uh, about these face shields and them, can we make more of these and things like that. So that's when we started realizing that there is a major uh, shock shortage of face shields and how can we you know really contribute uh, in this um, in this time so uh, that's when we started with a whole campaign of of um, face shields uh, at our lab at makers with from the other two volunteers akshay and Sridhar, who just come in in uh, in that you know, ambitious goal of making 10,000 face shields at our lab and um, just amongst like four of us and uh, uh, we started a campaign so um, we basically uh, um, sort of space. so you can see on the right side there is um, this was our first prototype at the bottom you can see it's like a paper prototype where we uh, um, where we were just trying to see how to make them, then we progressed into this, then this type of design, and we keep kept progressing, 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 and now the face shield looks like this. So we went, we went about 21 design iterations in the process to come up with the final product, and it was out in the market uh, for donations and everything in the uh, in the time. But what was happening at Makers Asylum because we had access to the laser cutting machine and. Um, uh, we had access to the laser cutting machine and, uh, sorry, one second. Yeah, we had access to the laser cutting machine, so it was very easy for us to prototype. So what happened, uh, what happens when you have a space like this in an open community is that um, there's a lot of experimental things that can immediately happen. So the uh, from actually uh, thinking about the idea to actually prototyping and implementing and making a product out of it, 
generally the cycle in most organizations is much longer uh, in our case because we are a maker space we were in on in the right place at the right time uh, where we wanted to sort of you know create these the cycle of actually ideation to prototyping to actually creating the product was just about like a week's time. So just having access to tools like this um, really accelerates innovation is a uh, what I wanted to sort of emphasize in this slide. And that's how we sort of kept improving because the whole process of design thinking is all about iteration, use of feedback. So we used to literally go to, um, you know, the healthcare workers at that point in time were really working very hard. So just to get feedback from uh, people uh, and uh, uh, hospitals, we had to go to their houses at night at 12, 12 in the night to understand, you know, if there is any changes that they wanted. There were material changes. So we started with, you know, things like, uh, an MDF as a material, but then we went into acrylic that we found out that that's very brittle. Then we chanced upon a sunboard, which is uh, a very interesting material uh, because it's completely waterproof and it's very light because you also wanted the face shield to be pretty light because you're, you're you know, because the healthcare workers are wearing them, uh, you know, for seven to eight hours in the day. So how do you sort of keep that going? and uh, things like that. So we get, got a lot of feedback in the process because the certification of these face shields is something uh, that we did not know about. So it, we relied a lot on user feedback. So the whole process of design thinking was uh, what we teach at Makers Asylum was actually quite implemented in the case of these M19 shields. And at the time, you rem uh, and this is the time when I'm talking about a very choked supply chain. So there was lack of material, there was lack of uh, transportation, there was, everything was, pretty much blocked. The first time we had to send about 500 shields to a hospital in Bangalore. Uh, it took about three to four days for Blue Dart to actually ship them out. So that's when we realized that it's important for us um, to sort of create a distributed manufacturing network of these labs across the country where uh, we could open source our designs and open source the process and get more makers to make it and serve their local communities. Because um, even if we tried like with 20 people at our space to, you know, um, you know, even do everything manually and get more people, uh, we wouldn't have been able to scale at the level. So that's when we decided to open source our design. And, um, and because we believe a lot in open sourcing, because uh, the whole space uh, and the whole talk about open innovation is very important for Makers Asylum and in general for us as a community, because, uh, and I'll go to those slides a little later. Um, so that's when we open source our design. And um, uh, in 49 days, we were able to actually scale uh, these face shields from zero to one million. Uh, in just about 49 days with the help of distributed manufacturing and open sourcing the design. And because uh, most of these labs, and you can see this whole growth of how it sort of came to a million. So we started on the 29th of March, the campaign. And by 15th of May, we had about uh, 1 million face shields that we had donated, distributed in uh, 42 cities, towns, and villages. And this is a little bit of a distribution curve of all the labs which are part of it from various parts of the world, uh, various parts of India and also the world, actually. So we had people from Kolkata, Mumbai and all of that. But we also have people from different villages and towns and smaller cities as well in the country. So it was very exciting for us to sort of see um, this whole, uh, the whole open source community and the maker community sort of get together at this time to sort of really contribute in a very meaningful way uh, uh, during the pandemic. So if you see this yellow line was actually Maker's Asylum where we kept making very uh, steadily, but like you see these other lines which had gone like really up. So most labs were catching up and doing really exciting work at the time. So it was like pretty much all parts of the country they were joining in and uh, we had a very interdisciplinary group of people. So there were anyone from filmmakers to um, to doctors, to, uh, you know, photographers, to, um, uh, there was an analyst, a business analyst, a neuropsychologist. Uh, so it was like a very, and a media house. It was a very interdisciplinary group of people. And the importance of interdisciplinary groups is very important to bring in different perspectives to the same uh, problem statement. So in our case, it was very exciting because we could do multiple things uh, in terms of the outreach and things like that with the, with the help of the whole community. So there were about 300 volunteers who were across the country. Uh, you can see all of them on the uh, video call over here. We had the youngest volunteers. The youngest volunteer of the M19 collective was 12 years old. 
and he and this was a boy from um, uh, uh, Bhavnagar in Gujarat and actually him and his sister they made these face shields at home without the help of a laser cutter as well so they were able to actually make them at home and they made about over 350 of these and actually distributed to the hospitals and healthcare workers in Bhavsar in uh, Bhavnagar in Gujarat and so we sent it across board we also started making these face shields for kids uh, at the time because there was a lot of um, uh, because masks are not something that are very, uh, you know, um, uh, recommended for kids. So we started making these for them. Uh, but I wanted to sort of show you guys, this is a slide that one of our friends, Bodo, who's in New York, uh, and he's been doing some great work around uh, prosthetics with his uh, own daughter, uh, talks about. So the closed innovation cycle, when we think about IP and all of that, is that there is a big idea, then you go into design, you build, you test, you analyze, you design, you build, you test, it sort of goes into that. So there are marginal incremental improvements only that happen this, uh, and then there's a successful solution. But what happens in a open uh, social innovation cycle, and the multiple big ideas uh, that are there in the community, right? And then of design and Richard, we lost you for Rich, yeah Richard, you were not audible from closed innovation onwards Okay, uh, she is joining into again. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Did I disconnect? I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, did you guys? Where did I? Where did I lose you guys? Uh, closed innovations. Uh, where okay. you were sharing about your friend? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. One second. Yeah. Can you see my uh, screen now? Hello. It, it's uh, loading. Yeah. Yes, now we can see it. Closed innovation. Great. So what I was saying is that the difference between a closed innovation cycle and open innovation cycle is that um, there's not only one idea, there are multiple ideas in an open innovation and solutions are much more accessible. Uh, Richard, we lost you again. I think there is some network problem. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Yes. I don't know what's happening. Can you see my screen? Can you see my uh, screen? You're, you're sharing the other screen. Uh, yes. Uh, now okay. I can. Okay. So sorry. I don't know what's happening with my connection. But yeah, that's what I was just talking about. Like the multiple successful solutions. And there's more insight when there's an open innovation cycle versus a closed innovation cycle when you're talking about IP versus open sourcing. So we are a big believer in open innovation and uh, we generate a lot of solutions at an exponential rate. So uh, that's what I wanted to talk about. And this is a little bit about all the other products that we've been making. So we started making these uh maprs which are active respirators for healthcare communities these are reusable and sustainable ppes as well and um this we lost you again richa you are not audible Richard, we cannot hear you. I think there is some network problem. 
Yeah, she's there in the meeting, but we cannot hear. Yeah, her. maybe her internet yeah. shows. I think is now it's. Yeah. Okay, she is coming. I think this is because the presentation, and she's using the web browser. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Yes. Yes, Richa. I'm not really sure what's happening. Uh, I think you're using the web browser. <laughs> Probably that's why it is dropping. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but okay. Uh, yeah. I, I suspect it is because uh, the bandwidth that you have at this place is not enough to do both audio and your presentation. The other thing yeah. that you could do is if you send your presentation to some of us, uh, yeah. maybe to the organizers, they will handle the presentation and you can continue talking. Yeah, fair. That will also work. And that, that's one approach that worked for me in some sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch off my video as well so that at least it's... Uh, not taking that much bandwidth, but I mean, I'm pretty much um, I'm pretty much through with the presentation, so I'm just gonna try to uh, quickly share it at the moment and see if it's working. Um, yeah. Can you see my? Uh, can you see it my? Is, yes, we can see that. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to quickly wrap it up. And so that's our uh, team that's been um, working. I could show you a little bit of the video that I have on the initiative. Uh, do we have some time? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. So let me just show you how this all went about. Uh, and uh, just a quick... Require a wartime effort to be able to ensure that every medical staff is against the unavailability of PPE kits. We are by. To 8,000 personal protection kits left in the Delhi government stock. I mean, I think I'm Today, they seven multiple designs. Four cities have caught on to making 4,000 shields. Today, we ended up making 2,200. And we tried multiple versions overnight. In fact, like Nakpur, Mohit, and Ravi from Jaipur to join the four. They call M19. <laughs> Yeah, so I just uh, wanted to share this video with you guys where uh, 
it just sh sort of shows the power of open sourcing, open innovation, having community uh, labs and maker spaces across the country and how it can be so powerful in the way that it can be a real um, boon for the uh, society at large. Because I think at the time when um, the governments and big organizations couldn't do a lot, I think um, the community maker spaces and the makers across India and this is not this is the same story that happened across the world as well every maker space in the world actually just got to work and making so it sort of it just sort of shows the whole maker culture and the mindset of these makers and what we truly uh, sort of represent is this um, this uh, you know layer of people on the grassroots level where uh, who you know you don't even think would be uh, sort of adding um, uh, who one would not even think about were the protective, you know, support for these healthcare communities. And I think the maker spaces all across the world was such a frontline support to these frontline workers. And I think it's a great, great uh, global story of all the maker spaces who just got together and started working. And they were not coordinated with each other, but all of them were doing the same thing. They were making, and that's what they were doing. And I think that's the power of uh, a community and a space like this. And uh, uh, and I think I really believe that it's very important that uh, make spaces and the make a culture somewhere that you, people um, start experimenting with. Uh, no. Yeah. Definitely, Richa. And it was wonderful to. S yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there was some, uh, your voice was halting in between a little, but definitely I understand your message. And I think the girls have also got it that innovation or little tinkering can lead to such innovation, which can lead later lead to help and uh, benefiting the society in a much larger scale, especially as you can see in the post pandemic, like as you can see in the pandemic period when it is going on, how a little bit of keen observation can lead to a really good innovation, which can really help the community on this particular scale. Richa has drawn his journey in such a beautiful way and the work that they are doing and the importance of doing things with our own hands, experiencing the magic of making, it is really commendable. Especially the importance of identifying the problems with keen observation, working with people coming from diverse backgrounds, and then and as she mentioned, that interdisciplinary fields, when you are thinking in all the fields together, or if you have help or you are using expertise or potential of different people coming from different background, you really can make the change. Thank you, Richa, for a wonderful conversation and bringing your initiative that has helped India a lot in this pandemic time. And now, uh, if I have you and Professor Nagarjuna now, I would like to take questions from Kalpana Fellows so that both of you can answers, answer those questions. Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, Darshna, do we have Professor uh, Nagarjuna? Yeah, I'm, I'm around, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so I will be taking questions from girls. And they have been asking about, we have to, one of the girl, Yachina, she suggested we have to adopt Chat Shala because once we discuss about STEM things in Chat Shala, then explore our ideas to create something scientific, as this is, they have mentioned. Uh, one girl, uh, Supriya, she's asking, uh, what are the strategies that can help in making effective STEM education accessible to all? Okay. So uh, I have uh, I have shared the screen of the uh, Chatshala platform. Are you able to see it? Yes, yes, end? sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, I will answer this question uh, in the following way, in the sense that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, a project uh, called the Cube. So you, you can see uh, there's something called cube chat here. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, the cube chat cube actually stands for collaboratively understanding biology education. Okay. So 
biology background, so I tinker in biology. Uh, and many of my colleagues and friends in the lab also we do that. And uh, so uh, if you actually look at some of the posts, uh, I would invite all of you to uh, have a look. Uh, not only those who are doing biology, but anyone can actually go and look at it. So if you can look at it during this pandemic time, uh, we have been running uh, 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 every day from 5.30 to 9.30. Every day from 9.30, 4.30 to 9.30, Saturdays, Sundays, every day. So which means that you can imagine for the last six months, there is not a single interruption to this collaboration. Wow. What are we doing? Uh, we were actually discussing uh, everybody's projects. So uh, how do we, uh, so we, we are not going to the college, so what do we do? Well, uh, you can start experimentation uh, projects uh, at home. So uh, all of you know that uh, you can catch a fly, such as a fruit fly in your kitchen. So then what do you do with the, with the fruit fly? So, uh, so we discussed all those things here. Uh, and now uh, we have certain chemicals uh, that are available uh, only in the lab, the college but uh, we don't have those chemicals at home. So what do we have? Do we have an alternative? So we don't have uh, agar agar, which is commonly used for creating the meat for the fruit flies. So uh, one of the uh, student innovators, an undergraduate innovator, uh, and what she did, you know, uh, you know, Suji, uh, uh, Suji, uh, and uh, which is what we, uh, in South, we make upma with, uh, upma rava as we call it. So, we used that as a substitute uh, with the tomato juice uh, to provide some other additional nourishment for the flies uh, to work with. And uh, that created uh, an innovation. So what do you do when you don't have a lab? I mean, you actually create uh, uh, the stuff. So, so it might look like biology, but then, you know, we are actually tinkering and creating and innovating during this process. The children, what do they do when they don't have X, they don't have Y? So find out alternatives for that. And that is actually what we call, uh, uh, you know, that is exactly when the creativity begins. You look for alternatives. You look for alternative ways of doing things. So that is exactly what I would suggest uh, we should be doing. But whatever you do, whether you do it in the lab, whether you do it in the classroom, whether you do it everywhere, just don't forget just one thing. Don't uh, say a classroom environment has to be silent. A classroom environment has to be a place where you talk to each other create as noisy classrooms as possible. So it has to be a chat shala, not a part shala. And you can even convince your teachers telling them, look, we have no depth of looking at good, bad, ugly content all over the world. Internet is full of content. There is no depth of good uh, 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 lessons or even good uh, lectures uh, that you can hear. You want the teachers to participate in your conversations, answer your questions, or ask the teacher to ask questions to you you know, and so that you can uh, prepare those answers. And all these things don't take anything. The only resource that you need is uh, willingness to spend your time in all these explorations. So if you have time as a resource, which is the most expensive resource in our life, uh, we live a short time. And so we need to use that resource as much as possible. And don't waste your time uh, in uh, what I can say, uh, uh, becoming a consumer of knowledge. Uh, spend your time in producing knowledge. And when you start participating in that, uh, it's not at all uh, difficult to do this process. So, I mean, this is just uh, my invitation saying that uh, if you have many other questions, uh, follow-up questions, I mean, you can almost ask them uh, at this chat shala uh, called the metastudio.org. Just join here and uh, start asking these questions. Uh, we, uh, we also have another uh, interesting uh, uh, principle is that uh, geek, meek, and weak all are welcome to our chat shala. So we don't have any selection at all. Uh, everyone is invited. Uh, we have absolutely no uh, uh, selection process. And uh, But then what we do is uh, we actually grant badges uh, when you uh, start conversing. So if you start conversing, uh, you get badges uh, for uh, what you display during this process. So this is uh, what I'm saying. So essentially what I'm saying to say is that uh, I answered a uh, very short answer to your question is be frugal. If you are frugal, uh, we'll be able to achieve uh, what we want to achieve. 
sir can you explain frugal in other terms to our girls as uh, again because most of them doesn't understand few words okay so uh, well uh, frugal essentially would mean uh, uh, like uh, uh, something like uh, what uh, in the cricket example i showed uh, for example uh, you don't have those lightweight uh, very wonderful wickets that you get in the sports shop then what do you do you don't have money to buy them so what you do is uh, you just go and uh, pick up most of them doesn't understand you don't have sticks uh, okay so uh, well uh, frugal essentially would mean uh, so this is what uh, I mean like by, uh, frugality and i told you like i don't have agar agar which is very expensive uh, medium uh, to buy uh, from uh, biochemical chem- chemistry shop so you don't have agar agar then what do you do well uh, what is agar agar actually so it's just carbohydrate right so can i make agar agar substitute using uh, uh, for example kanji at home can i just war boil rice and convert that into uh, agar agar or can i use chena grass uh, which might substitute for agar agar uh, can i uh, so this is what i call frugal thinking okay, okay. like it is almost like you know uh, it's also another way of looking at it like for example uh, how do i uh, use uh, hammer as a paperweight definitely right. it's like finding uh, I mean, other person yeah uh, another other person use as of what you what you have at home like you know you you just uh, think about it uh, you will be able to find out uh, what you can do about it and so frugality also means that uh, sophistication is required in the mind and not in the lab definitely yeah. so we can work on so sophistication and is 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 about being creative you know you know it's not about uh, expensive toys I just wanted to add to Professor Nagarjuna's point uh, about frugal, and just to convey it in a, you know, that we are a big believer in jugard, and yes. uh, <laughs> that I mean, frugal is a jugard mindset jugard. as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so finding alternatives to carry out the basic thing that you want to achieve later yes. on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Bharti. I just wanted to add one small thing. It can be gully cricket equivalent of uh, sophisticated science, so sophisticated cricket that people are playing. So definitely. Yeah. So I think uh, girls are understanding the meaning of it, and it is really aligning with the thought we shared in the internal panel today. Now uh, there is another question. Uh, thank you, sir. And now I will take this one question for Richa. And the question is, ma'am, can you please suggest some tips to improve our coding skills? how can we adapt more coding techniques in more programming languages this is gunjan uh, our kalpana fellow asking you um hey gunjan uh, thank you for your question i think um, you know like when i was uh, doing my uh, 10th and 12th grade i was re- really not good at coding so i think what one of my teachers kept saying was you need to really practice so uh, i think um, there are a lot of tools available and the different kinds of you know programming languages right so you have anything from python to java to sql to uh, you know various different languages so uh, one uh, we do a lot of uh, we uh, do a lot of work around python and uh, you know basic assembly line uh, for electronics and stuff like that coding for electronics and drones etc so depending on what language it is i think the important part is practice and there are a lot of tools available online and uh, and free tools which are available uh, you know lately where you can actually just you know log in and start making stuff and these days what's happened is there are these blocks of codes and you know you don't even have to write a code but you can you know use these blocks to sort of create more application based coding and things like that so there are multiple options i think online and uh, i think the Uh, the bottom line would be practice if you really like coding or if you want to really good uh, become